All right, in this video, we're going to talk about Bernard Boxill's article on reparations. Now, um, Boxill is now emeritus. He's retired from UNC Chapel Hill, and he's written a lot about these topics. Our selection is actually drawn from an article he published in 1972, which shows you that the debate's been going on for a long time. So Boxill's thesis is this. He says, the present generation of white Americans Oh, the present generation of Black Americans reparation for the injustices of slavery inflicted on the ancestors of the Black population by the ancestors of the white population. Now, here's his general principle. He gets his general principle by considering some cases which he thinks we're all going to have the same intuitions about. So let's consider a case where Dick steals Tom's bike. What should be done here? Who owes who what? Well, it seems pretty obvious that Dick owes Tom the bike and perhaps an apology, an admission of guilt. What if Dick steals Tom's bike and gives it to Harry and Harry doesn't know where it came from? Well, who owes who what here? In this case, it seems like Harry owes Tom the bike. You got to give the bike back and an acknowledgement, not that he's guilty because Harry didn't know where the bike came from, but an acknowledgement of error. Mistakes were made here. I shouldn't have your bike. What if Dick steals Tom's bike and they both die? Well, who owes who what now? It seems like Dick's heir owes Tom's heir the bike. Uh, uh, if they both have children, then uh, Dick's child should give Tom's child the bike back with an admission again, at least of error, if not of guilt. So here's the general principle that Boxo gets from these cases. That is, the beneficiaries of an act of theft owe reparations to the victims or to their heirs. Now, the beneficiaries may not be the thieves themselves. It could be somebody like Harry or um, like Dick's heirs who, who just happened to get the bike from the thief who was Dick. All right, now let's apply this general principle uh, to the case of uh, slavery. So here's how Boxwell's first argument goes. He wants to say this, each white person individually owes reparations to the black community because each member, because membership in the white community serves to identify an individual as a recipient of benefits to which the black community has a rightful claim. Okay, so let me formalize this. First claim is that each individual white American possesses wealth that's traceable to slavery. Well, wealth that's traceable to slavery rightly belongs to the Black American community. And this is based on that principle that Boxill just uh, elicited from us on the previous slide. And what follows from these two premises is that, therefore, each white American owes reparations to the Black American community. And where do you think people might push back on this argument? Well, we can imagine a couple of different objections that people might make. First of all, to the first premise that says that each individual white American possesses wealth traceable to slavery. You might say, hold on a second. Um, some people, some white Americans, their antebellum ancestors were not slaveholders. Maybe they were in the North after slavery had been ended there. Maybe they lived in the South, but they weren't slaveholders. Um, so what about them? Um, some Americans, some white Americans have ancestors who immigrated after the war, after the end of slavery. Um, and also you got an Americans whose ancestors were slaveholders, but whose ancestors have lost perhaps any wealth that they derived from slavery. <laughs> so the, uh, the descendants are not beneficiaries of the theft. Okay, so what about this? And what, what do you think Boxel might say? I'm not sure, but I think one possible reply that he might make is this. All American wealth is traceable to slavery in one way or the other. Uh, slavery was uh, just a huge integral part, not only of the Southern economy, but also the Northern economy as well. Uh, so even if you weren't directly engaged in enslaving people, you might be profiting from the enslavement of of blacks. And so you might say, therefore, it has ongoing effects on all parts of the economy because of generational wealth and the way that that's transmitted. Okay, so let's say that's true. 
it's plausible. I'm no economist, but uh, one one concern here is might be this: that look, maybe that's true. But then, if if that second premise is true, that's going to mean that all American wealth rightfully belongs to the Black American community, and that seems well, maybe implausible. It might seem extreme, maybe not. So let's look at premise two. What did premise two say? Premise two said that wealth traceable to slavery rightly belongs to the Black American community. <clears throat> and the objection here might be this, just a parallel of the objection that was raised uh, to the first premise about, about uh, the white community. It's difficult, if not impossible, to establish the individual ownership rights of enslaved persons and trace those forward to their living heirs. In other words, it's difficult. Um, well, first of all, it can be difficult to trace your ancestry back to an enslaved person. But let's say you can do that. If you can, um, it may not be immediately obvious how much wealth was expropriated from your ancestor and therefore how much uh, wealth is owed to you. And that's difficult to figure out. How much did they labor? How much was their labor worth? And so forth and so on. Well, you might say, though, hey, it's not necessary to distinguish the individual claims here of each individual Black person. The Black community is like a corporation. It has collective ownership rights. So we only need to make a conservative estimate of the total wealth expropriated by slavery. The idea here is that a, reparations are not owed to a whole lot of individual Black Americans, but rather uh, as, as a whole to the Black community, as if it was a corporation. Well, the worry here might be this. Is the Black American community like a corporation? Does it have collective ownership rights? You might think that only individuals have those kinds of collective ownership rights. Only as individual heirs of slaves are they owed any reparations. There is no Black America Incorporated, as it were. And this brings us actually to, I think, a, a central issue in the reparations debate. The, the major objection to that second premise was that not all Black Americans um, inherit ownership rights individually from enslaved ancestors. And the reply was that, look, we're appealing to collective ownership rights of what we might call Black America Incorporated, the Black American community as a unit. Now, the, the that brings us to the objection to the first premise, and that was that, look, some individual white Americans don't have wealth tracing from slavery. Now, you could also answer that objection with an appeal to collective debts, just like we had collective ownership by Black America Incorporated, maybe White America Incorporated is like a corporation too. And as a whole, the white community owes uh, the Black community. So like in a corporation, if you're uh, a shareholder, then you get some of, um, it, you're, you're, you are part of the entity that is responsible for whatever is done by any of the individual members of that entity. So, you know, if Coca-Cola or some other corporation, one employee there does something bad to people, well, the, the whole corporation, Coca-Cola gets sued. There's, there's a collective responsibility, even though not all the employees were involved in the bad thing that one employee did, the company as a whole is liable. That's the idea that's being applied to racial groups that are being regarded as corporations. So here's, here's one way you could argue this. Boxel argues that the white community can be regarded as a corporation or company, which as a whole owes reparations to the sons of the slaves. It doesn't matter if you or your ancestors were individually guilty of enslaving people, you are part of a corporation uh, which is guilty of enslaving people. And so you share in that responsibility. So it goes like this, white America incorporated as a unit is a beneficiary of theft. That is the theft of uh, expropriating wealth from enslaved persons. Premise two, Black America Incorporated is the victim of the theft. Uh, and the beneficiaries of a theft owe reparations to the victims. 
Therefore, White America Inc. owes reparations to Black America Inc. That's how that goes. Now, this argument raises, as I said, major questions about the whole idea of collective corporate responsibility. Is the white community really like a collective entity, like a corporation that has debts and liabilities? Is the black community a community like that, that has collective ownership rights? Boxel argues that, that they are. Um, and he says, look, there's similarities and there's differences between the white community and a corporation, but the similarities are what really count here. Um, so he says, here's the similarities. First of all, white people share interests distinct from and opposed to the interests of other groups. A pause. Let me explain what I mean by interests, what Boxel means by interests here. He doesn't mean they're into the same sort of stuff. Like all white people are really into uh, Taylor Swift and Coldplay. Like they're all interested in the same bands. That may or may not be true, but it's not what he means. By interest here in this context, we mean something that brings advantages to the group or something that affects someone or something. So we say a union takes care of the interests of its members. That is, it looks out for them, for what's good for them, right? And the idea is um, the same things are good for all white people. They share interests distinct from and opposed to the interests of other groups. And the things that are good for white people are bad for other groups. That's the claim. And the same would be true of all members of a corporation. Secondly, white people undertake joint action to protect and enhance their interests. So, you know, you might think it's good for all white people if other groups are exploited and they profit from that. And white people actually undertake joint action to try to do that. Okay, that's the claim. And that's what makes it white people, white people Inc. Similar enough to a corporation to be held collectively responsible, even if not each and every individual white person uh, does all the same bad stuff. Boxel acknowledges that there are differences between racial groupings, like between white people in between corporations. They're important ones. First of all, um, people don't join their racial group voluntarily, like you might sign up to work for a corporation or to be a shareholder in a corporation. You didn't choose your racial group, you're just born into it. And secondly, unlike corporations, there isn't a board of directors or any kind of central decision-making procedure for white America. And the question is, What's more important here, morally speaking? The similarities between white people and a corporation or the differences? And are the alleged similarities even real? Is it true, for example, that white people share interests that are distinct from and opposed to the interests of other groups? And is it true that they undertake joint action to protect and enhance those interests? By the same token, is that also true of um, black people or other racial groups? Is it true of all racial groups that they share interests which are distinct from and opposed to the interests of other groups? That's what Boxo is going to have to argue in order to make sense out of the collective responsibility notions that are functioning in that second argument. And that's what you need to think about. I mean, there's, I, I leave you to consider those. Uh, uh, these, these questions about corporate responsibility. If it is true that certain racial groups, or maybe all of them, do have these similarities with corporations, are they in fact bearers of collective responsibility? Is the group as a whole responsible for um, things, even if not each individual member has undertaken the same actions as individuals? Think about that. Worry about that. Let me know if you know the answer.